Hi, this is David Orlovsky, and welcome to the Robert Orlovsky Show. And whether you're watching with our friends over at Tour Anytime, or wherever you watch or listen to your podcast, as always, thank you for joining us and spending this time together. And this is, of course, our special Hanukkah podcast. I know I'm interrupting my Shabbos podcast. Uh, but don't worry, they're coming uh, right down the uh, right down the pike. I got more. I've got more to talk about on Shabbos. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Uh, I, I said if having a podcast has taught me one thing, it's that I can talk for hundreds of hours without really uh, missing a beat. So I got a lot more to say on Shabbos. <laughs> I can't imagine I was going to get tired of it. Shabbos comes every single week, but Hanukkah. Is a once a year opportunity, and uh, as the Maharal explains, uh, actually in uh, near Mitzvah, in reference to Hanukkah, we don't look at time as a circle. You know, time is a circle. You say, okay, you know, you go through the Mazolus, you go through the twelve months of the year, you go through the four seasons. It's a circle. We don't look at time as a circle. We look at it as a spiral. Says the Maharal. So you always come back to the same spot, but always on a higher level. So that when we count uh, for Yoival, we don't count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21. So it's always the same seven, but always on a higher level. And says Rabbi Desla, we're supposed to do that every Shabbos. We're supposed to go through a week and look at it always as if we're coming to that Shabbos on a higher level. So when uh, Hanukkah comes around, we always have to look at it from a fresh perspective. Um, if you go all the way back, and, and I'm always amazed when I find people who have just discovered the Rabbi Arlowski show. Uh, as I mentioned, we're still in our process of a fundraising drive. So if anybody wants to help, by the way, uh, some people said, is it okay, you know, if I don't actually sponsor, you know, uh, episodes, but I just make a, a random donation or someone just contacted us to give a monthly donation. Yes, that helps too. <laughs> it goes towards the expenses, but, um, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we like to be able to go off and do more things and new things, and uh, uh, obviously we need we need the uh, the funds to be able to make that happen. But um, uh, uh, one of the things I would love to do is advertise because apparently there are a lot of people who don't even know this exists. There are even people who I would categorize as Robert Olavsky crazies who don't know that I have a podcast. So uh, it's really very interesting. Uh, suddenly I meet somebody and they say, oh, you you have a podcast? I didn't even know. You know, I listened to your, your recordings. I didn't know that you have a podcast, you know. So uh, they still have my cassette tapes. <laughs> so uh, it would be nice if we could advertise it, you know. But uh, every now and then people go back and start at the beginning. They suddenly discover it and they start from episode one. And whatever I have to say is, is clearly timeless. And um, so uh, they start at the beginning and suddenly they stumble on that uh, very first uh, rant that I did because I was uh, relatively well-behaved at the beginning. And then I had people complaining that said, uh, you know, uh, why are you talking about these different things? It's it's not a, you know, it's not a sheer. I'm coming to listen to a sheer. And that's, I stress, that's why it's called the Rebbe Olavsky Show. We talk about all kinds of different things here. So yes, we give across Torah. Yes, we give across Chizuk. But sometimes... Uh, I'll talk about whatever I want uh, before we begin. So we do have a sponsorship for this episode. Baruch Hashem, sponsored by Yoel and Ahuva Shmel. God bless you guys. We love you. In honor of Rabbi Olavsky, thank you for sharing your Torah with us, and we wish you good health. Ezra Hashem, thank you so much, and uh, right back at you. <laughs> it's uh, so nice to have you, for, have you as part of the Rabbi Olavsky Show family. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I, this is the Hanukkah, uh, uh, and I have, of course, an important message for Hanukkah I want to share. But first, every you'd be surprised how often, <laughs> more often than one would imagine, uh, 
I get uh, emails saying, how come we don't give any more recipes? <laughs> so um, it's really uh, it's really interesting. You know, when it comes to Hanukkah, there are essentially uh, two foods of choice. Yeah? There are basically latkes and, uh, and there are sukhaniyot, which are jelly donuts. Um, jelly donuts are just too much of a mess. I, I, I've, I don't make jelly donuts. I can buy jelly donuts. I have a general principle that I do not knock myself out to do something that I can buy the equivalent that's just about as good. Yeah. And I, I, my usual example of this is potato kugel. Right. I, I know everybody is very proud of their potato kugel, but I've almost never made in all my whole life a potato kugel that was as good as one that I could just buy at the Macolet or at the takeout place. <laughs> And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of peeling and and uh, grating. And, and there's a special kugel knife. Half of it's grated, half of it's mushed up. You have to mix it all together. You know, at the end, you have the same kugel that you buy at the Macaulay. So I'm, I, I don't waste my time on those kind of things. In fact, um, one day I'm going to put out a cookbook. Uh, my children have really, really asked me not to. <laughs> Because it is a cookbook for dummies. That's why I'm, I'm putting out this cookbook for people who, you know, want to do it on the method that my mother taught me, which is fast and easy. And that's it. Anything that's a pachka, we don't do. We don't do those here. Uh, we first got married. So my wife, of course, who was raised to be an intellectual and to study and to do homeworks and write reports, I was raised to be a housewife. So I had to teach her how to cook. She didn't really know how to cook. So she was a little sensitive about it at the time, you know. So I happened to be flipping through looking for a green bean recipe. And I said to my wife, oh, you would never make this. And she was immediately offended. So why not? I said, okay. Shell the almonds. Blanch the almonds. Peel the almonds. Sliver the almonds. Fry the almonds. You go, okay, I'm done. <laughs> There's six steps and you're not done with the almonds. There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> We're not doing it. So I agree, I agree a hundred percent. So, um, uh, so I, you know, I put out a cookbook, but um, uh, on the uh, on the section of side dishes, you know, different side dishes, um, and so uh, one of them is um, um, easy potato kugel. Uh, go to the store, buy a potato kugel. <laughs> That's my easy potato kugel recipe because it's just not worth the time. That's my opinion. Yeah. So Sufgani Yot, uh, my kids all make Sufgani Yot, and it's a tremendous amount of work and effort. And I don't, that's not one of my things. I can go off and buy them. And uh, okay. So if you go to uh, Angels, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention places, you know, I, I haven't bought from Angels in many years, but it used to be that you'd go to Angels Bakery and you'd buy them. And they were basically old challah rolls, you know, that had been soaked in oil long enough that if you put a wick, you could recreate the Hanukkah miracle, you know? And then they sprinkle a ton of, uh, you know, powdered sugar on top of it. It doesn't speak to me. But, uh, for example, there's a bakery here in Harnof, Nougatine. Ah, unbelievable. <laughs> Delicious. Or if you get the Ribat Chalav, uh, I guess those are the caramel ones from Berman's. You know, when they first come out and they're fresh and mushy. Ah, delicious. So I'm not going to spend my time doing something I can buy. That's my general principle. You know what I'm But uh, latkes, it's very hard for me to find really good latkes. Yeah. Um, uh, I could give you the recipe, but you could just look it up for yourself. Uh, I take it from the classic kosher cookbook, which was put out by uh, Sarah Finkel, who, of course, Rav Nussan Svi Finkel, the Rashiv of the Mir, his mother. <laughs> She put out a cookbook. <laughs> you know, Nelson Sweet Finkel grew up in Chicago. He went to actually a co-ed high school. <laughs> but people would tell me, they would, they would, um, they would uh, meet his mother, you know, and she'd say, uh, where, do you, where do you learn? He goes, in the mirror. He goes, oh, you know my son, Nate? He goes, I, I don't know who shirt he's, he's in. He goes, no, no, he, he works there. Nate, Nate, Nate Finkel. And they're like, Nothing's me, the Rosh Hashiva. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nate. <laughs> uh, that's why when Rav Noach Weinberg would refer to his brother, Rav Yaakov, who's the Rosh of the Israel, as Jack. <laughs> so, yeah, my brother Jack. 
Uh, it was a different time. It was a different time. You know, I mean, Nissel told me he was driving once with, uh, with uh, Moshe Shapiro and he goes, Menachem, Tazelcher Kasha Hayita Manny? Yeah. Tazelcher, uh, you know, when this guy was, was Adam, remember when this guy was Mike? <laughs> Moshe goes, ah, the good old days. <laughs> I went to yeshiva. I mean, in my day, everybody had English names. Then they came to yeshiva and I had to change them around. But, you know, they still they still uh, uh, stick with us to these days, you know. It's amazing. Anyway, but um, uh, so that's the recipe that I use. Uh, I'll just give you um, the the my one hint is always grind up when you put through the food processor, the potatoes, let them sit and pour off the extra liquid. That's, that's my, that's my little, let it sit again, let it sit again, squeeze out the excess liquid. That's what I do. That's, I think is an important step uh, in, in it. And then add the onion, because if you squeeze it out when the onion's in it, you'll end up squeezing out most of the onion flavor. So add the grated onion after you've squeezed out the potatoes. The second thing is make sure that the oil is hot, 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 hot. Otherwise, you get the mushy ones instead of them coming out and being crispy. Very important. Um, my kids, who are much more foodies than I am, when they fry something, they always put it onto a draining rack. I haven't got the patience to set up a drying rack, you know, like a sl slotted rack that you put it on for, the, for them to drain, not me. I uh, use paper towels the way my mother did <laughs> to put them on. So now I I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, uh, something that just occurred to me this year that I, has been a quandary for me for years, for years. And I finally decided this year I have to come up with a solution. Um, a... Uh, uh, there is a minig to have a Hanukkah Masiba, uh, you know, Hanukkah party, Hanukkah get together. The brought down halacha, there's no din to have a suda on Hanukkah, but there is a um, uh, an Indian to have a suda as a reason for shirais v'sishbachais to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Since Hanukkah is lahodos ulahalel. This gives us an opportunity. And uh, we eat milk eggs. Why? Because Yehudis gave the general milk to eat, and then he got thirsty, she gave him wine, and then when he got drunk, she chopped off her head. It's very interesting. Uh, we say in the Gemara, Ein simcha el babasa. Meat has happiness. Uh, Ein simcha el bayayin. Wine has happiness. Fruit, you bring the bikurim. You know, uh, vegetables, you bring trumas and maestras. Um, almost everything has significance in Judaism except for milchigs. The only time you find milchigs used is before you get someone drunk to cut off their head. That's how Yael killed Sisra. That's how you discuss them. <laughs> the significance of milchigs is to get someone to chop off their head. Just to put it in perspective. Talk about lactose intolerance. <laughs> but in any event, so we make a milchig meal and... You know, here's the thing. When you make a flesh of a meal, you know exactly what you're making. There's a main course. There's a side. Milchings, you just keep eating. <laughs> you keep adding, you know? So um, uh, I make uh, an unbelievable uh, lasagna. Yeah. I use American lasagna noodles. I don't know these Israeli lasagna noodles. I don't know what they are. Uh, I tried the pre-boiled ones. I don't like them. I boil up the... Uh, them beforehand. And I basically take little containers of 9% cottage cheese that they have here in Israel. In America, they don't have 9% cottage cheese. I think there are laws against that. Um, there's only so much fat that a person is meant to ingest. Uh, people use ricotta cheese, but I always find it has a different kind of a taste. But anyway, so I use that and eight of those little containers somewhere between eight and 10, and I add an entire bag of grated cheese and mix them up together. I add a little salt and pepper. Um, if, if I've got some, uh, some uh, dried parsley, I mix that in too, mix it up together. And then I use tomato paste. I don't use sauce. My mother used to use uh, sauce. I use paste. 
And uh, I usually bring over one of my grandchildren because uh, it's too much work for me um, because I have to open up all those little containers and scoop it all out. <laughs> and of course, my father brought me up to be frugal. Uh, my son Yaakov says that's a fancy word for cheap. That's okay. We don't waste anything. When I crack an egg, I put my finger on the inside and remove whatever is still clinging on the inside. And when I take a, a container of cottage cheese, it takes me forever until I get all of it out. Then I have to scrape off the part on the top, you know, and fine. Uh, eight to ten containers uh, and a thing of uh, cheese. And so I have my, my, uh, my grandchildren do that part for me. And... Uh, and I have the sauce open, I'm all ready. But I do that before I cook the noodles because otherwise you have the noodles end up getting sticky. So I drain the noodles and immediately, yeah, spray a little oil on the bottom of a nine by 13 pan. I line up, uh, I use Ranzoni noodles, so I have three, three noodles. And then my grandson goes over it with the tomato paste. And then I add a layer of filling and then three more noodles, and then tomato paste, and the filling, three more noodles, and tomato paste, and sprinkle some uh, extra grated cheese on top. That's it. It's unbelievable. Um, I make a mac and cheese. Uh, I find that the best mac and cheese that I ever had was uh, was in Hunky's uh, Pizza in West Hampstead. You know, it closed down and reopened someplace else. But, you know, I remember there and I, I remember I, I asked Richie who, who ran it. How do you make your, um, how do you make your uh, uh, mac and cheese? Says, I'll tell you. Now, first of all, if you can get American macaroni, it's a lot better. And the Israeli ones are too large, but, you know, get the small ones. And uh, you put it in about a container of milk. I'm saying like a quart of milk whole milk, and uh, you bring it to a, a low temperature, and then you just keep adding in slices of American cheese. I have somebody bring it back from America for me. I don't know if it works with another cheese. I use American cheese, yellow American cheese, because otherwise it doesn't look like mac and cheese. And I just keep adding pieces, and I stir it up, and I see if it's creamy enough, and then I keep adding more, and I stir it up, and I keep adding it, I keep melting in the cheese. And then you add some salt and some white pepper. Well, salt is to taste. I, I often err on the side of salt and I add too much salt. So I, I, I gotta, you're going to have to taste it, make sure that it's not too salty and salty enough. You pour it on, mix it up together, put it into a pan, stick it in the oven with a little slice, a couple of slices of uh, American cheese on the top. You cook it. It's unbelievable. So that's it. So those, those are the pasta dishes that I make. Um, there's... Uh, uh, we make different types of fish, you know, um, we have, uh, I have, I have my onion soup. I think I gave the recipe for that before I gave my, uh, I do my orange soup and I say my orange soup, but full disclosure, I also took it from my taste buds recipe, uh, cookbook that I bought years ago. It's a, um, butternut squash, sweet potato soup. And it is absolutely delicious. Uh, I know I gave a shout out uh, to Taste Buds uh, about their chocolate chip cookies that, that apparently um, on on the Instagram. I don't have Instagram, but she she uh, she mentioned that I mentioned it. So now I'm giving a shout out about her orange soup. And in fact, when Taste Buds was still open, the, the cookbook just came out. I I had read it in the Mishpacha, and I couldn't find. The recipe, I didn't have the cookbook yet. You know, they didn't come to Israel. I called her up in the restaurant. She gave me the recipe. You know, I remember the time she says, I think I put in too much nutmeg. I don't think so. But um, uh, so I make orange soup, delicious, vegetable soup. I mean, the the uh, onion soup with cheese, you know, it's okay. Um, my daughter makes fresh hot cocoa. And uh, we don't have whipped cream in a little can here in Israel. They just don't have it. So we have to whip up our own whipped cream, put a little dollop of whipped cream. We get some uh, um, little mini marshmallows, you know, at the end. And then we go straight to the hospital to have our, our stomachs pumped. <laughs> take, take a couple shots of insulin. Because <laughs> if you weren't diabetic before this meal, you will be afterwards. <laughs> Anyway, one of the things I serve, of course, at a Chadakam are the latkes. So the problem is 
even if I set up two frying pans, and I can't really do that because there's a lot of stuff cooking. And, I, you know, so I end up with one frying pan. But even if I have two frying pans, you know how long it takes to fry uh, latkes for 30, 40 people? You know, can I know her? I've got uh, nieces and nephews here. Uh, I've got, uh, I've got just my immediate family is, uh, is close to 30, you know, it's, it's, it's a big crowd and, and, and there's nothing like a latke when it comes right out of the pan. So you're trying to cook them and everyone's grabbing them right off the plate. So you can never like bring it out. Cause as soon as they cook, people grab it right out of the, out of the little, uh, plate. It's, it's a, it's a challenge. So I'm trying to figure out how to make the latkes in advance. And uh, I discussed it with one of my food uh, foodie friends. Uh, I'll give him a shout out, Yitzi Shapiro, who's a good friend of the of the show, and um, he's he's into all kinds of stuff. You know, he's he ha he has a sous vide, he has uh, uh, you know smokers, they've got all kinds of stuff. I don't understand any of these things. You know what I mean? I have a pot, a frying pan that I understand. So I said, can I fry them in advance, and then like. Just quickly refry them beforehand again. He goes, no, they'll get soggy. So he says, but this is what you could do. This is his suggestion. I'm going to try it this year. We'll see how we do. Fry them beforehand and then freeze them in layers with like, uh, you know, wax paper in between. In the free. Then take them out when they're frozen and get like a pot of oil, get it really hot and drop them in for just... 20 seconds, they should pop and cook and come back to life that way. So I'm going to try it this year. If it doesn't work out, I will report back to you. And then I will give you his number if you decide to try it also and it doesn't work. And we can all call him and tell him how we feel. <laughs> anyway, I felt that was important just to uh, to talk a little bit since people have been complaining. I, you know, where are the recipes, you know? In fact, uh, we actually uh, toyed with the idea of doing a cooking segment for Hanukkah, but, uh, you know, we'll save that till we get a, a little more. Uh, maybe maybe we'll we'll save it for before Purim when we make a challah juice. I'll show you how to make my stuffed cabbage because I've gotten much better at it, you know? So we'll uh, we'll see how we do that. Uh, Brian Regan has a hysterically funny routine on cooking shows. He says, you know, I, I wouldn't mind cooking if I had all the ingredients on the counter in pre-measured little bowls and I just pour it into the pot. He says, he says, if I made a cooking show, it'll be like, I suddenly realized I don't have any eggs. Come with me now as I go to the store to buy eggs. <laughs> There's always ingredients you forget. You have to try to put things together, you know, but to have everything all set up in little measured bowls, you know, he goes, and after they pop it in the oven, there's a cooked one already in the second oven. <laughs> they just take it out. Why did I waste my time making this one if there was already a cooked one in the oven? I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we'll see. We'll see if we'll do a cooking episode. All right. That's just a little Hanukkah treat there. I hope I put on. I hope this looks like a Hanukkah-ish tie. I look for a Hanukkah tie. Anyway, so um, uh, let's let's uh, give a Hanukkah idea that I think is extremely important. There is what's called the famous Beis Yosef's kasha, because the Beis Yosef asked the kasha, but of course it's answered by Rishonim. And that's always interesting when you see that, you know, this Rishon gives an answer to the Beis Yosef's Kasha. He lived before the Beis Yosef. But it became known as the Beis Yosef's Kasha. That's, that's how it's known. The Beis Yosef's Kasha is the following. Why is Hanukkah eight days? Instead of one day, we get presents. Eight crazy nights, right? Why is it eight days? So... One of my kids once said, because there's eight holes on the Hanukkah. <laughs> that's that's as good an answer as any. <laughs> but um, uh, his question is like this. We know the story. Uh, they uh, finally captured the base of Mikdash, and they wanted to rededicate it. And the first thing they wanted to do was light the menorah. They didn't even have a menorah. They had to set up bunch of uh, uh, shpudim to be able to use as a temporary menorah. And uh, they had to search to be able to find taha oil. And they finally found 
a tiny amount of, of Taha oil, enough for one night. And they filled it up and it burned for eight days. That's the miracle. So ask the Beis Yosef, if there was enough oil to burn for one night, then that wasn't a miracle. It was the next seven nights that was a miracle. This is the Beis Yosef's kasha, and there are a lot of answers. The answer is, you're right. The fact that it burnt for an extra seven days, that was a miracle. The first day we're celebrating the Hanukkah uh, uh, Mishkan. The fact that we rededicated the base of Mikdash. And by the way, Hanukkah is seen as the dedication of the base of Mikdash. The Mene Soscha discusses this. That um, uh, he brings uh, from Tehillim, the Posik, uh, that puts together uh, basically uh, Tishrei, the, the Shvatim of Tishrei, Cheshven, and Kislev. And he says, uh, what's the reason for that? So he says, well, the Mishkan, as we know, was finished on Hanukkah, but it wasn't put up until Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So uh, it was made up to Hanukkah, says Bnei Soscha, that the second base of Migdash was dedicated then. Because the first dedication that took place was not a real dedication because the Persians were in charge of us at that time. And, and, uh, and Cyrus the Great, Koresh, was, uh, was supervising uh, what was going on. And so uh, it wasn't considered unique. Here we finally achieved an independence and we were able to dedicate it. And that was made up to Hanukkah because it missed the dedication that should have taken place by the Mishkan. So too, the first base of Mikdash was finished in Cheshvin, and uh, it wasn't dedicated until Tishrei. And therefore, Cheshvin will be when we dedicate the third base of Mikdash. Rebbe Soscha brings this down um, in Cheshvin. But, uh, but the, the idea that Hanukkah is the dedication, that's what we're celebrating on the first day. The first day is the dedication, and the next seven is because of the nace of the candles. The other answer is, the fact that they found this Pach Shemen, the little cruise of oil that was still Toha, after the Greeks worked so hard to metame all of our oil, that was part of their battle plan. They set out with forethought and malice to be metame all of our oil. Yeah, Spartacus, Eradicus, uh, Hepatitis, everyone, Tommy the oil, Tommy, 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 Tommy. General, I found a barrel. Stick your hand in. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the fact that we found one with a seal that was still tall, that itself was an unbelievable nace. Yeah. Um, the other answer is this unbelievable victory that we had over the Greeks. It was a Robin Biad Mahatim. It was a small group of, of uh, Kohanim. They were not fighters. And they were going against the Greeks, the greatest military machine that the world had ever seen. The fact that we won that victory was a miracle. That's the first day. Uh, there's a beautiful answer. And that is that um, Everyone brings the Gemara with Hanita ben Daiser. Hanita ben Daiser was very, very poor. Even though the Gemara says the entire world was fed only in his chus, he himself had very little money and uh, lived on a small amount of food from week to week. So uh, came time for the Shabbos candles. There was no oil. He says, what do you got? Goes, we got vinegar. He says, burn vinegar. He says, vinegar doesn't burn. He says, the same God who says that oil can burn says that vinegar can burn. Because when my kids uh, went to science class, uh, the first thing they write in their notebooks is hateva in gematria is elokim. Uh, what we call nature is God. There's two ways that God runs the world a systematic way and a non-systematic way. The systematic way is what we call uh, nature, teva. And the 
non-systematic way is what we call miracles. So the first day we're lighting and celebrating that oil burns. And then that the oil continues to burn miraculously, that's just an extension of the, of the nature that a Kodesh Baruch Hu made. So these are different answers to the question. There's another answer that a number of Mepharshim give. And I want to focus just for a moment on, um, on uh, the Pnei Yeshua's approach, how he answers the question. And I'll put it into context. The context is the following. How do you like the menorah? Brisa, second parak of Shabbos. How do you like the menorah? It says, Mitzvah ne'er ishu beisai. Every house lights one candle. Every day. Mahadrin, everybody in the house lights one candle. Mahadrin, mina mahadrin, oh, that's already a machleik, is beisil mishamai. Beisil el, which is what we do, the first day you light one candle, the next day two, then three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, Beis Shammai says, the first day you light eight candles. And then you light seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Why? Says Beis Shammai, post-chimolich. You keep getting lower. Like you see by the um, bulls that we offer on Sukkot. The first day we bring 13, then 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. So you go down. Says uh, Beis Hillel, it's a fine svara, but we have a rule, Malam Kodesh Vein Maridin. When it comes to holy things, we go up, we don't go down. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, Yonis and Rosenblum, who's one of the major speakers on behalf of Orthodox Judaism in the world. So he told me that uh, at some point he decided to grow pace. He didn't have them, but he grew pace behind his ears. And he went to America to speak. And one of the other major uh, Jewish Orthodox leaders there said, why would you do this? We have a hard enough time as it is with, with our beards and our dark clothes and our hats, you know, that we're already standing out. Now you have to add to it. You're not going to do it. You never had it. So he came back and he thought, maybe, okay, so maybe I'll cut them off. I just, I just started. And he asked his Rebbe, Rebbe Moshe Shapiro, who said, We go up, we don't go down. Once you go up in something, you don't go back down. I thought that was such a fascinating insight. And that's why I've never grown my payas behind my ears. And that's also why I will not wear a frock in a Hamburg, because without the payas, it looks really ridiculous. <laughs> So uh, that's why I, I I always try to trim my beard for two reasons. One is my my beard turned white right away because it was sort of a reddish brown. Reddish brown turns white. My hair is brown. It's slowly turning gray. I say slowly uh, because that's what people tell me, but I think it's growing, getting gray faster and faster. But, but my beard very early on turned white. And uh, when it grows out, I, it adds at least 10 years to me. I look very, very old. And, uh, you know, we live in, we live in a society that uh, um, values youth. So someone said to me once, you know, well, you're getting on in years a little bit. You know, I'm, chashiv, you know? I'm at retirement age. Uh, too bad I don't have a job. Otherwise, I could retire. But um, I said, why don't you grow your beard out? I said, because my beard doesn't grow with the Rosh Hashiva beard. It curls in. So I come out looking like the wolf man. So, you know. I'll come out looking like a wolfman Santa. I mean, it's just not going to go, you know? So, so that's why I keep my beard trimmed, you know? But Malam uh, you go up, you don't go down. That's the principle. So um, uh, that's what Basil says. So says the Pnei Yeshua, why in the world would you learn from the Pari Achag? Now, I have a whole share on why you might, because other people do give an explanation why you would learn out from Sukkis over here to Hanukkah and the connections between them. In fact, um, I have, as I was looking back at past podcasts that I've given on Hanukkah, I noticed that I gave one on the Sukkis Hanukkah connection. So if you want to go and do a search, uh, wherever you watch or listen to your podcast, hopefully that one is there and you can see it for yourself. 
or why listen to it for yourself. But um, um, but Pinesha says no. The only reason Beis Shammai is mentioning this is to show that in response to Beis Hillel, who says Malam Kodesh then there is a example of where you can go down and not go up. But it doesn't explain the reason. He says, what, what's the reason of the Machlech is based on Beis Shammai? What are they really arguing about? They're not arguing about whether or not you should follow the, uh, the bulls that are offered on sukkahs or not. That's not the base of the Machlech. The base of the Machlech has to be something else. He says, Beis Shammai is bringing a raya to respond to Beis Hillel, who says that you always have to go up in Kedusha, that you can go down. And he says, the Machlechus is like this. And he brings the base Yosef's kasha. And he says, why is it eight days if there was enough oil for, for one day? He says, you understand there was no way they could have just filled up the menorah and lit it. And it burnt for uh, eight days straight. Because there's a din of Trumas Adeshen by the menorah. That every day... You have to clean out the menorah, take the ashes and things like that, and you put it by the side of the Mizbeach where it gets swallowed up by the earth. And you have to set them up again, and then you light them every day. So if they just poured in all the oil, comes the next day, they would have to clean it out and put in more oil. That wouldn't have helped. So he says, here was the nace of Hanukkah. You took the Kad Shemen and you filled up the Neiros completely and you look at it and you say, oh my gosh, it's almost full. I would say I only used about an eighth of the, of the oil that was here. Remember the Wesson commercial and it all comes back except for one tablespoon. You know so it's, it filled up completely and I still have seven eighths. Do you realize that at that moment, they already understood the Nase of Hanukkah? And now I know it's going to be eight days. Because on the first day, there was one eighth of the oil that burnt the entire night. And then they pour in another eighth and another eighth and another eighth. And so it lasted eight days. So Be- says Beishamai, that's why you light eight candles, because right away at the beginning, they knew the Hanukkah was going to be eight days. That was the unbelievable uh, understanding. And as each day goes by, it becomes less of a miracle because they're just watching the Kad Shemen. They're watching the little clay slowly begin to run out of oil, getting lower and lower and lower as we go along. That is the miracle of Hanukkah, says Beis Shammai. If you will, the miracle that we are celebrating is the Kad Shemen, where we watch the oil slowly starting to go down. Says the Pnei Yeshua, Beis Hillel says, you're right. But nobody saw that except for the Kohen who was filling up the menorah. Klai Yisrael just knew that we found enough oil for one night and that's it. What's going to be tomorrow? I don't know. Suddenly comes the second day, and it's still burning. And the third day, and the fourth day, and they knew it was going to take eight days to get oil. Either because they were tame, mace, and it would take them seven days to become taha, and then one day to make the oil. Or because, as the Gemara says, they would get the olive oil from Gush Chalav, which is a four-day journey from Yushalayim, so it would take four days to get there and four days to get back. But they knew it was going to take eight days. So they said, okay, they found the Kad Shemen. It'll burn for one day. Hey, it's still burning for a second day, for a third day, for a fourth day. Each day was a greater insight into the miracle that was taking place. Says the Pnei Yeshua, the essence of Hanukkah is whether you're looking at the menorah or you're looking at the Kad Shemen. You're going down 87654321 to parallel the little container of oil, or the insight that the Jewish people got every day look, it's still burning, look, it's still burning, and it's increasing in intensity. Two ways of looking at life. 
Because we look at what's there. We don't look at what's inside of the Kad Shaman. I've quoted this beforehand. My wife says, uh, we have eight girls. So when they would go to high school, you'd say, girls' high schools only want girls who don't need high school. Uh, high school should be a time where a girl gets to develop and turn into a young lady and develop as a person. Uh, I could say the same thing about yeshiva katanas. What in America they call high school. Who have yeshiva katana, which is a yeshiva gadola, only smaller. The people are smaller. They have smaller hats. They have smaller chairs. They have smaller gemaris. Everything is a little smaller. <laughs> it's otherwise exactly the same. Three star of gemara, you know, exactly nothing different. It's not an opportunity for a person to grow into somebody. It's that's it. You're now you're now at yeshiva bachar, and it doesn't make a difference if yeshiva katana or yeshiva gadola. Exactly the same. As opposed to sit down and say, what should a yeshiva katana be doing in order to develop? this Bachar so that he could be successful in Yeshiva Gadola. It's a process. People are supposed to go through a process. So that's what we go. We go through the process. But uh, a lot of people don't want the process. A lot of people just want the finished product. You have to be perfect now. I told this story beforehand uh, a friend of Luzza Langsam told me he met a Shiva Shiva Katana. He says, we take only the best boys. So he says, well, that doesn't say much about you as a mechanic, does it? You only know how to work with the best boys. You're so limited as a mechanic, you can't help anybody else. And what exactly is the best eighth grader? <laughs> That's one of the most brilliant lines I've ever heard. You know? What is, what do you know, the best eighth grader, you know? A person has to develop. One of the principles of Chinuch that my wife heard from a friend of hers that is was our mantra when we were raising our kids is the purpose of Chinuch is not to raise good kids. It's to raise good adults as a process. So we live in a world where we have to respect the process. Right? Rabbi Kalish from Waterbury, that's one of his famous lines. Respect the process. There's a process that you have to go through. You go from one day to two days to three days and you watch it getting brighter and brighter and brighter and building to a crescendo. You know, the Gemara says that in this world, we pass like Beis Hillel, but in, when Mashiach comes, in the world to come, we'll pass it like Beis Shammai. Because now we don't appreciate potential. If you look inside of the Kad Shemen and you see from inside there what people can't see, and you can see the entire miracle taking place. You know, uh, people get married. Uh, they only want to marry a, a finished product. You know, it can't be. You chasa until you get married. Or well, as the expression goes, um, when you get married, until you get married, you're not complete. After you get married, you're finished. <laughs> it is a process. You have to invest. Rachel looked at a 40-year-old uh, poor, ignorant shepherd who didn't know how to read olive bays and said, yeah, he's going to be the greatest God Ador that ever lived. He's going to be the greatest Torah scholar in Jewish history. She saw it. She saw Rabbi Akiva in the ignorant shepherd Akiva ben Yosef that nobody else saw. She saw what was inside of the Pach Shemen. She saw what was happening underneath the surface. That's hard for us in this world. In this world, we, we look at the external. We look at what we can see. Um, potential is... Uh, is not something that we appreciate so much. I, uh, I've thought about this my whole life. Um, I was working someplace, and one of my Russian yeshiva said to the guy who I was working for, who knew me when I was in yeshiva, he says, is he effective? He says, he's tremendously effective. 
And he shook his head and said, I never thought he'd amount to anything. Now, I appreciate that because I had dyslexia and ADD and all kinds of different difficulties. And a person who looked at me said, this person will never amount to anything. I understand. I understand. It's difficult for us to understand, but I've heard this story already from several people that they said from Chaim Kanievsky when he was younger, he, he had, he had, uh, he didn't have a head for learning. He was, uh, I heard it from somebody who was on Chayda with him. He was shocked that he turned into Chaim Kanievsky. And that's why they wanted to make a kol, kolel for only for the Elyonim. And the Chazanish says, no, you don't know where Torah is going to come from. You know, you, you look at somebody and you think, ah, he's never going to amount to anything. And if only anybody had looked inside of the Pach Shemin and said, no, there's something more here that I'm not seeing, that this person can maybe go on and be successful. And that becomes the terrible challenge in, in our job of being Marbet's Torah and in raising children and in working with people is to see the potential inside of the person and figure out how to make it work. There's an article in the first Chicken Soup for the Soul, which I cannot wrap my head around. I still can't. Uh, I, I read it a couple of times. This teacher was in Harlem, and there were these black kids who were not succeeding uh, you know, in their studies. And he decided what would be a great idea is make a chess club. <laughs> Let's make a chess club. He teaches them chess. To make a long story short, they go on and win the national championships and come in second in the international championships. And one of the kids at the end says something that that's how the article ends. He said, we were stupid until Mr. C told us we were smart. Then we were smart. To be able to see that potential. There's studies that have been done that when I was growing up, there was the A class and the B class. The A class was all the smart kids. The B class were the people like me. Anyway, so one year they told the teacher the B class was the A class and the A class was the B class. And that year the A class got average marks and the B class got exceptional marks. Because people saw the potential and helped them to realize it. That's the miracle of Hanukkah. You can look at the Pach Shemen and know the miracle is taking place before it even happens. Or you can wait until you see it shine in the menorah. And in this world, very often we have to wait till we see the person succeed. Right? What's the expression? Uh, success has many fathers and failure is an orphan. When I took over Long Island NCSY, they had gone through five directors in two years. It was worse than nothing. If I was coming and starting from scratch, okay. But like this, our credibility was so shot. And I went from town to town and I spoke to different people and they all explained to me why it wouldn't work. It's not going to work in Long Island. It's not going to work for this reason, for that reason. And, and they were all right. And uh, the first year we built it up to 100 paid members, then 300 paid members, then 500 paid members. We made sports leagues. We made publications. We made all kinds of things. And once it was successful, everybody told me how they could have done it better. <laughs> First, they told me how it couldn't be done. And after I did it, everyone told me how they could have done it better. That's how it works. So, uh, so if you have the ability to see the potential, to see what's there and have a little imagination. When... Uh, when uh, the Punisher Jerov, uh, I think it was Yecheskel Sarna, he took him out to B'nai Brak and he started showing him, here I'm going to build the yeshiva and here I'm going to build the base Yaakov and here I'm going to build, you know, uh, an orphanage and I'm going to do this, you know. And it was just sand dunes. This is the story I heard. I didn't check it out. I'm not Pesach Krav. He went back to Yerushalayim and he sent a psychiatrist to go and talk to him because he thought that he lost his mind you know, in Europe with the war and everything. He's building buildings in the middle of the desert. 
But he looked and he saw the Pach Shem and he saw what was inside. He understood the miracle that could be created if you can look underneath the surface. So Mir Hashem, when we light the menorah, every day, you're right, we're going to get a deeper insight with each added candle. But take a moment to think about the Pach Shemen and understand the miracle is already there in the potential waiting to come out. Okay, and that's it uh, for our regular program. And now we come to the question and answer program. And uh, we have a sponsor for the question and answer, sponsored by Yona Shum. I don't know if that's Shum or Shum. I'm going to go with Shum over here. Yeah. Who says anything for Rabbi Olavsky? I love you. <laughs> I'll Shum Ma. <laughs> Okay, first question. We have some Hanukkah questions here by Baruch Pearl. With Hanukkah on the way, was the miracle of Hanukkah a, quote, waste of time, so to speak? The Hashmanayim themselves mostly ended up becoming Hellenized anyway. Yeah. If you're looking for a happy ending, you're in the wrong religion. <laughs> in my unpublished book, the last book you read before you assimilate. I have a chapter on Jewish history. And uh, at one point I write, and then the Jews lived happily ever after, which in Jewish history is about 40 years. So if you're looking for the happy ending, that'll happen when Mashiach comes. I mean, look, you know, the uh, uh, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim ended in that entire door dying in the, in the Midbar and never making it to itself. If you look about the door who came into Eretz Shell, uh, they built the base of Migdash, which was destroyed, and they went into Gullis. They came back and built the second base of Migdash, which was destroyed, and they went back into Gullis. So if you're looking for a happy ending, we don't have happy endings, but that doesn't mean you don't celebrate Pesach. That doesn't mean you don't celebrate uh, the occasions. And therefore, on Hanukkah, I, I'll tell you what the Gemara says. The Gemara says it beautifully. The Gemara and Shabbos, which discusses my Hanukkah. So it discusses everything that happened, and they lit the menorah, and it burned for eight days. And it says, and the next year, they made a holiday. What does that mean, the next year? Why didn't they do it immediately? The answer is because, was this a one-time miracle, of which there are miracles? We don't celebrate when the sun stood still for Yehoshua, although that was a tremendous miracle. Yeah, there are, there are all kinds of miracles that we don't make a holiday about them. Only if the miracle represents something greater. Let me give you an example. Um, the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying on Lagba Omer. So is Lagba Omer a happy holiday because they stopped dying? So the Maharil says that they died for 33 days spread out from Pesach to Shruis. That's what the Gemara says. It says they died between Pesach and Shruis. It doesn't say they died from Pesach to Lagba Omer. They died for 33 days. We condensed it. And any day that was a special day, they didn't die. They didn't die on Shabbos. They didn't die on Pesach Sheni. They didn't die on, uh, you know, on, uh, on Rosh Chodesh. And they didn't die on Lagba Omer, which means that it's not that Lagba Omer is a happy day because they didn't die. They didn't die because Lagba Omer is a happy day. We just didn't know it yet. So after they saw this tremendous miracle, they waited till the next year with that ability. B'nai Bina, Yemei Shmona, Kavushir, Anim. B'nai Bina, those with that Bina. Maven Dava Tach Dava. They waited to see when the next year came around. Did they feel that power of Hanukkah, even though there was no miracle that year? And once they did, they said, wow, this is not just a one-time miracle. This is something that's built into the Bria. And then they said, hey, look at that. The Mishkan got finished being built on the 25th of Kislev. I didn't realize that was significant. Hey, look, the 25th in the word, word in the Torah is or. 25 or. I didn't realize that. And suddenly they start finding Hanukkah references all over the place. And when it lists the Masos, the 42 journeys that uh, 
stops the Klai Yisrael made. The 25th is called Chashmono. <laughs> so there's, the, the, there was a significance to the, the day that was integral. It doesn't matter whether or not it lasts or not. It doesn't matter how the Chashmonoim end. It doesn't matter if the Mishkan and the first base and the second base and destroyed and all of these things. If there's something inherent built into the Bria called Hanukkah, that's what we gain from Hanukkah. And the fact that the historical, uh, we're not celebrating the Hashbanayim per se, we're celebrating our Nisim, our Niflaos, our Chuos, our Milchamois that we fought. Yeah, we're still fighting those battles against the Hellenists. Yeah, we're still fighting against the Greeks. Yeah, we're still fighting against Plato. Somebody asked me, I couched him. He says, why do you Jews have a problem with Plato? I said, you know how hard it is to get out of the carpet? Anyway, the point is that, you know, we don't look just at the event itself, but in the greater manifestation that was Megala through this miracle. And another Hanukkah question. Why is it that some dreidos have a shin and some have a pay? Does it change the rules of the game? So I have a whole share on this. You can look it up uh, wherever you you look up your Rabbi Alaski Shurim, <laughs> wherever you came them from. It might be called Nez Gadol Hayashama. It might be called The Secret of the Dreidel. I talk about this at length, but I will give you Bekitsur, the, the Dreidel answer. Um, it always said a shin. It didn't necessarily stand for Nez Gadol Hayashama. That wasn't the uh, main reason. These four letters have all kinds of significance. For example, the Bnei Soscha says, then the Haftorah, by Hanukkah, in Yecheskel, it says, you'll take a piece of wood and write Yosef. Take another piece of wood and write Yehuda. You'll put the two of them together, and they will become one. So too, Klai Yisrael will come back together. And he says the essence of that is all about Hanukkah, is the essence where the two come together. You can go take a look at the Bnei Soscha to see where that is. But he says, when do two pieces of wood come together when you spin it. And that's why the Pesach says that Yaakov sends Yehuda to Yosef, Goshna. Goshna are the letters that are written on the dreidel. So these letters are significant for a very long time. So came along at some point in the 70s, I guess, and uh, some Israeli had the clever idea of changing it, since it means Neis Gadol Yosham, changed the Shin to a Pei, and say Neis Gadol Po, because we made it here in Israel. Now that's ridiculous, because the first dreidels in the Hanukkah story took place in Israel, and it already said Neis Gadol Yosham, because the word Shum is very important to Hanukkah. Yeah, Shmona, Chashmanayim, Shemen. There's a lot of Shum words there. Uh, so the the Po is just silly, just silly. But you can listen to the whole Shia explain why it, it's meant to be Shum and not Po. But uh, but as far as the rules go, so um, uh, when I was in school, so they used to give us a little dreidel, and you know we'd play with it, and it was like you get to miss class and you get a free dreidel and you get to play during school. I mean, I, it doesn't get much better than that. You know? So one year I get my dreidel and I said, Rebbe, it's defective. It has a pay. He says, this is a new improved dreidel. I said, that's ridiculous. I want my old dreidel. He says, no, it makes sense because when it lands on a shin, what do you do? Pay. So it makes more sense to have a pay. <laughs> This is one of the ridiculous things that people say, that if you say it quickly enough, you know, it sounds like it makes sense. Like someone was giving a spirited uh, explanation of why we should all celebrate Thanksgiving, you know, because it's a day of giving thanks. And what do they eat? They eat turkey. And what is turkey in Hebrew? Hodu, which means to give thanks. So you see, you're supposed to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Okay. Anyway... But uh, they changed it. Uh, the main reason I would give is because of Amaratsis, because most people have no idea what they're doing. I remember during the 1970s when we were out marching for Soviet Jewry to get them free, that they should be able to be let out. 
and uh, we would go and have demonstrations. I was in I was in the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County. They would bus us to the Russian consulate in Glen Cove, Long Island, where we'd make a demonstration. And I was very in favor of this because we got to miss school and we get on a bus and we don't have to have class. I mean, except for getting a dreidel, it's just as good as Hanukkah. <laughs> And we would chant, one, two, three, four, open up the iron door, five, six, seven, eight, let our people emigrate. What do we want? Swaboda! <laughs> That's freedom in Russian, I think. I don't know. Um, anyway, so, uh, so the Triple SJ, the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry, came up with this brilliant idea of adding a fourth matzah to the Seder, the matzah of hope for Soviet Jewry. And even I, as a teenager, thought to myself, that's got to be one of the dumbest things I ever heard. You mean there aren't enough references to freedom in the Seder that you have to add another matzah? How long do you think that's going to last? You know? And of course, eventually, even anybody who might have been doing that stopped it because it was silly. And, uh, and this is a problem when you create something that is just made up and isn't real. So uh, at the risk of being politically incorrect, you know, the state of Israel has what they call Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. Now, we've had that for many years. It's called Tisha B'Av, because that's when we remember the Holocaust and the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades and every tragedy that the Jewish people have gone through. But they decided to make a public day of mourning for the Holocaust during the month of Nisan when you're not allowed to have any public mourning. So you understand it's, it's not going to go. <laughs> and um, and uh, the reason they chose that day is because that was the day of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising because that fit in with the general Zionist philosophy. Holocaust survivors who came to Israel hid the fact that they were Holocaust survivors because Israelis called them sabon, soap. Like you guys just went like sheep to the slaughter and you didn't fight. Therefore, the only worthwhile people were the ones in the Warsaw Ghetto and like that who rose up and fought. You know, But if you went to your death, or like the Blue Shiver Rebbe who kept kosher during the entire Holocaust, he's not a hero. He's a martyr, but he's not a hero. That's why it's called Holocaust Remembrance of Heroes and Martyrs. If you had a gun, you were a hero. If you just, you know, died because you were a Jew, you were you were a martyr, but you weren't a hero. You know, we we call those people heroes. Anyway, um, so when Yitzhak Rabin was uh, prime minister, I guess it was the early nineteen nineties, and um, he had a education minister who was from Meretz. And I remember he made a big announcement where he said, it's no longer is relevant to just focus on the Holocaust. We shouldn't have one day just to remember the Holocaust. We, instead, we're going to make Yom HaShoah a day of the suffering of all people the slavery of the blacks in America, the Armenian genocide, the suffering of all people it means it didn't take very long for something that everyone thought was going to be tremendously significant to become insignificant. When the Twin Towers went down, I remember reading quotes, it was either Newsweek or Time, interviewed various famous people for their quotes, and one of them was the Novominska Rebbe as the head of the Aguda. And his quote was, the world will never be the same. Two months later, I was speaking in a girl's high school. I won't mention where. And I said, uh, what should I speak about? They said, anything except 9-11. The girls are sick of hearing about it. So the world was changed forever for less than two months. And then it went back to everything else. So when the Chachamim make uh, something, it's the significance. As Noah Weinberg always said, we Jews have been accused of everything over the years, being communists, being capitalists, you know, drinking the blood of Christian children, all kinds of things. The only thing no one's ever called us is being stupid. So when you find a Jewish minug, you have to be very wary. So if we always had those four letters on the dreidel to change it, you change Jewish tradition at your peril. And that's it for this week. 
If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, RabbiOlowski.com. You can sponsor an episode. You can sponsor a question and answer. You can sponsor a five-minute Parsha. You can uh, ask a question. You can leave a comment. Uh, you can sign up for one of our online shiurim, the Daily Daf Yomi, the Monday Masil Shisharim for Women, or our tefillah class that we have on Sunday night. And that's it for now. Until next time, I am David Olavsky. Alichtach and Chanukah to everybody and for all of Klai Yisrael. And uh, this has been the Rabbi Olavsky Show. It's the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode, and we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show on RabbiOrlovsky.com. Torah, anytime, YouTube, and more. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simba, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Till next time, till we meet again. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. <laughs>